Let's turn to the book of Haggai. The book of Haggai, chapter number 2, is one of the last books in the Old Testament. If you get to Matthew a little bit too far, so just backtrack a few books, you should be able to find it. Just two chapters in the book, the book of Haggai. All right, Haggai chapter 2, we'll read verses 6 and 7. It says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into the message here this evening. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for your loving kindness to us. And Lord, for sending your son to this earth. As we are entering the Christmas season, we uh, take time to ponder it. Lord, I pray that it not the, the greatness of it not escape us. But Lord, we truly appreciate uh, what it took uh, for your son to come to this earth and to die on a cross for our sins to save us and to reconcile us back to you. And Lord, help us to keep that in mind, not only through the Christmas uh, season, but of course also through the rest of the year as well. And Lord, I pray that you bless this message. Fill me with your spirit as I preach. And Lord, touch the hearts and lives as only you can. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now this passage that we uh, read is dealing with, it's, it's a prophecy of the second coming of Christ. Not the first coming when he came to Bethlehem in a manger, but it's talking about the second coming when Christ will come. And of course we know, we know it's referencing that when it says the desire of all nations shall come. That is referring to Jesus Christ. And in this setting he is coming to... He is coming as the desire of, you could call it a corporate body of nations, of, of a nation um, made up of many, many different people, but he's the desire of all nations corporately. Um, he is the fulfillment of really what nations are seeking to, to achieve. His government is one that will be unparalleled in the history of mankind. No other government will be close to the government that Jesus Christ will set up when he comes and establishes his millennial reign. It is the desire of what nations want to be, the, the glory that is there and the, the prestige and everything that is found in the government of Jesus Christ in the millennial reign is unlike any other. But that's what all the, the, the nations would want to achieve. But tonight I want to look at the fact that he has come uh, he is the desire of the individuals of the nations as well. The desire of each individual, Jesus Christ, is. And, but he has already fulfilled this capacity when he came to this earth around 2,000 years ago um, when he was born to the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem there and, of course, laid in the manger as we are all familiar with. When he came the first time, he was coming to fulfill the desire of the individual. So when it says the desire of all nations, we can also understand that means each person living in those nations. Christ is the desire of. Not only the desire of the nations, but he's also the desire of each individual and he is the desire of the soul. I want to let's uh, turn to Psalm 107. Book of Psalms chapter 107 and we'll see how God fulfills the desire, the longing of the soul. If I can have an usher bring me up some water, I'm not going to go very long, but my voice may go even shorter than that. So if I can get some water up here, uh, there's a little table back here we can put it on. Psalm 107, verses 8 and 9 is what we'll read here. It says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. He satisfieth the longing soul. And every one of us has a longing in our soul that only God can fill. That he, will, he is the only thing that can fill. And many times people don't know this. They don't know that he is the answer to all their longings. 
I'm going to run through a few different uh, examples here of how Christ is the longing, he's the fulfilling of each soul. For the intellectual, Christ is the logos. And if you, those who dive into the intellectual sphere um, and they seek to find a meaning in that, Christ is the meaning to the intellectual, if they would only open their eyes and see it. Um, there are many people probably who have heard of a man named Jordan Peterson, a brilliant, brilliant man. And he, is, he unpacks truths from the Bible that I've never thought about. But he's not a Christian because he can't bring himself to the simplicity that is found in Jesus Christ. But he, he recognizes so much truth from the Bible, but he can't bring himself quite to the simplicity of Christ. What he doesn't realize is all he's searching for, he's searching for all these complicated things. When it's so simple, Christ is the fulfillment of that longing. For the child, God is the perfect father. To the widow, he is the ultimate protector. To the wounded, he is the balm of Gilead. To the desolate, he is the builder of the waste places. To the searching soul, he is the living water and the bread of life. To the timid, he is the good shepherd that leadeth beside the still waters. To the bold, he is the captain of the Lord's host. The list could go on and on. And we see the different types of people that we are or that we know around us, Christ fulfills the longing of each one of those. For time's sake here, I want to highlight just a few things that people desire and how Christ fulfills the, those desires. The first one that we'll look at here is the most important, that of redemption. People desire redemption. They may not put it in that terms. They may not know that that's what they're looking for. But they are seeking something in their life, and it is Christ. And this is only found through redemption. Let's look at Matthew 1, verse 21. One of the more famous accounts here of the Christmas story. Matthew chapter 1, and we'll read verse 21. It says, and she, shall be, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Again, many people are seeking this salvation. And many, many people know they're seeking it, and they, so they seek it through various means. To seek to be redeemed from their sin. Again, some people don't know that's what they're seeking for, and they seek to find fulfillment. They seek to find something. They know they're missing something. And they're looking, looking, looking. But if they would only come to Christ, they would find what they're looking for. And this redemption is, is it. Again, many people know they need something. And when we, we can look at the physical realm to kind of illustrate this. Thirst is an indication that your body needs water. Not necessarily that it needs liquid, that it needs water. Um, and so... It's very important how you choose to meet that need. Let's say a child. child gets thirsty. What does a child seek to fill their thirst with or to satisfy their thirst with? Oftentimes they look for juice. They look for a juice box or a Capri Sun or something like that. Something that they like, that they enjoy. And so they'll grab one of these uh, juices and they'll suck it down. Is that going to solve the problem? It is not. It's the wrong solution for that problem. It may placate it for a little bit, but pretty soon they're going to be thirsty once more. I myself have fallen victim to this. We, I played uh, with, a few, with a few other guys. We were playing basketball. We went, for, I don't know, it was like two to three hours. And I knew I needed water. I was, I was in my early 20s at this time. But instead of drinking water, what was, that, what was available was um, soda. So I had a couple cans of soda over a two, three hour time period while playing basketball. And uh, I, when, we got, when I got home, my wife had one of my favorite meals waiting for me. Um, but I was unable to eat it because I was completely dehydrated. And I, all I could do was just lay on the floor and like, try to get some more water into my system. Uh, it was the wrong solution to meet that need. And again, the same is true in the, in the spiritual realm. People often understand they have a need in their life. But like the child, they seek to meet that need through the wrong source. I'm going to read a verse out of Romans chapter 1. 
Romans 1, verse number 20. It says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God has made himself known that there is a need to every individual. Everybody knows they have that need. He has shown it through creation, that, there, that there's a God out there. And now they have a need to, to, uh, to know that they, are come, they have come to grips with him, that they're on good terms with him, if you want to put it that way. Um, they are without excuse. So now they must come up with the solution. How are they going to make peace with this mighty God? Because they have sinned against him. And, and again, I think everyone understands that. And redemption is needed because all of us have sinned, and consequently, we have been separated from God, from that creator, and sentenced to an eternity in a lake of fire. Jesus is the only source of redemption for mankind. There are many religions that will teach that there is no such thing as an eternal hell. That when somebody dies, they just go back to the dust of the earth and nothing happens. That is sadly false. God makes that very clear. Those who die without sin, those who die unredeemed, or with sin, excuse me, those who die unredeemed will spend an eternity in a real lake of fire. And so some believe that, and so they choose a different means, another source to fulfill this desire, to fulfill this need in their life. Some choose baptism. Some choose good works. But Christ is the only source for redemption. He is the only one who can meet that need. His death on Calvary paid the penalty for your sin. And now he is providing reconciliation back to the creator. And we'll see a verse, let's turn to Revelation chapter 5, that tells us this. That when we are redeemed, we have that reconciliation back to the Father. We are saved from our sins, and we have that um, we are now reconciled back to our Heavenly Father, the one who created us. Revelation chapter 5 in verse 9. This is talking about some individuals up in heaven, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Glorifying Jesus Christ because he had redeemed them. And what's interesting here is to say they're high, they don't highlight the fact that they were redeemed from hell. They highlight the fact that they were redeemed back to the Father. So now they have that relationship with their God. And that actually brings us directly into the next longing that we all have is that of a relationship. And this, again, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 4 now. Galatians chapter 4. We'll begin reading in verse 4. It says, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We not only do we have redemption, we've been saved from our sins, but we now have this relationship with God Almighty, with the creator of the world, the one who can speak things into existence, the one who can, if he wants to, change any circumstance we have a relationship with. How many individuals in the masses of humanity are surrounded by people, yet they lack a healthy relationship with anyone? They're just going through life. No good relationship. No healthy relationship. They just feel so alone in their lives. And then the Christmas season comes along. 
And they see all their friends, all their coworkers, gathering with family, with the significant people in their life. And they feel so alone because they have no relationship. This is why suicides are so prevalent during this Christmas season. Because people don't have a relationship that they could lean upon. Everything seems so shallow. They just feel so alone. We all desire a strong relationship with someone, with, a, with our spouse, with, with children, with friends. This is what we all want. We want that strong relationship. Nobody wants a, a, a harmful relationship. We want our relationship to be strong and healthy. And hopefully we have those in place in our life. But the ultimate relationship is the one we're going to have with our Heavenly Father, with God Himself. And the only reason we can have that relationship is, of course, because of Jesus Christ, as we read here in Galatians chapter 4. Christ redeems us that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because we are sons, God gives us His Spirit in our hearts, allowing us to cry, Abba, Father. One of the most intimate terms that a child can have is with his father. Saying, Daddy, Abba, Father. What a close relationship that is. And I know not everybody has a close relationship with their dad. But you can with your Heavenly Father. You can have that relationship to know that you can trust on Him. That any, any need that a, a father fulfills, God will help fulfill in your life. You can go to him with those problems that you can't fix, as my children do. You know, they, they get candy. Daddy, can you open this? They can't open the bag. So they come to me, and, they, and I open it up for them. And so God will meet those problems in your life. He'll be that source of strength, be that source of comfort for you. He is the ultimate relationship we should desire. He is the desire of our soul for this relationship. He will meet everybody's desire for a relationship if they will only put their faith and trust in him. There's no qualifications to meet in order to have this relationship with Christ, only to put your trust in him. Skin, to skin color doesn't matter. Uh, social status doesn't matter. Male or female, it doesn't matter. No parameters on it. Only come and put your faith and trust completely in Jesus Christ. And you will have this relationship with God. You will be adopted into the family of God and, and have the creator of all the universe, the almighty God, as your father. What a comfort that is to us. And what a great desire, what a need that is in our lives. And maybe we have been adopted into the family of God, but we're not taking advantage of this. As I watch my children try to do something, and they're not taking advantage of the fact that they have a father that can help them with it. They're going to try to do it themselves. And that's good up to a point. But sometimes, like, just wait, you're going to ask for help? I mean, I could do it in, like, half a second here. You're going to ask for help here? And how often do we do that with God? We just try to take care of our own problems, and God is just waiting there. You gonna ask for help at any time through this? What a go what a good God we have, um, and we have this relationship with Him. And while our other relationships will disappoint us at times, God never will. This relationship with God will never disappoint us. And again, trust. In a relationship is very key. And we know we can fully trust God to keep his word. And that leads us to our final point here. Our fi the final desire that every soul has. And I'm going to put it this way. Relief. Let's turn to first Tim or 2 Timothy excuse me, chapter 1. You could call this point peace, security. We'll call it relief here for the purpose of this message. 2 Timothy chapter 1. One in verse 12. The Apostle Paul is speaking here. He is 
at the tail end of his life at this point, he has suffered many things for Christ. And he's just kind of summarizing here in this letter to Timothy, verse 12. For the thing, for the which cause, excuse me, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul had full trust in this relationship with his father. And he said, I know I've suffered a lot of things, but I'm not ashamed of God. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him. Full, full trust in God. Paul had full security. He had relief from the different problems that life offers. And many people long for this relief. They long for peace in their lives more than almost anything else. And like redemption, they often seek to find this relief through various means. Drugs, alcohol, escapism. Seeking for peace, seeking for relief. But they can't find it until they come to the desire of the soul. The desire of all nations, Jesus Christ himself. We'll look to, briefly at two uh, points where he gives us relief in our life. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8. We'll look at the first one. Romans chapter 8. And this is relief from, from judgment, but really just wanting to be right. Wanting to know that you are in the right. I'm not saying for the case of, the, of an argument. I'm saying that you are living your life for the right thing, for the right purpose. Freedom from the judgment of others saying you're doing wrong. You're, living your, you're throwing your life away. Romans chapter 8, we'll start reading in verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall not he with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a triumphant passage of scripture that is. I love this passage. But as we're living life and we're trying to live our life for God in this dark, vile world, confusion abounding all around us, so many ideas of what we should be living our life for. People say you live it for yourself. Others say you live it for others. What are you supposed to do? You have the, the people who mock you. I can't believe you waste your time going to church. God gives us comfort from that, a relief from that, knowing that we are right. Those who serve God, who live for God, we are in the right. And though we may be outnumbered by a lot, God says, if you are on my side, what do you care? What do you care? If God be for us, who can be against us? I'll use my children again as, a, as an example. They occasionally get into disagreements. And given our current family situation, oftentimes it's two against one. But they both, both sides seek to get approval from either myself or Sarah. Now why is that? It's not really going to get, if the one is seeking it, it's not going to get them the majority. They seek this approval because it doesn't matter how many are on one side or on either side. It matters who is on that side. And if the parent comes and puts the weight of authority on one side, it doesn't matter how many are on the other side. And when we have God placing his approval, his authority, 
on our lives, it doesn't matter whatever anyone else is saying. So we can have relief from the judgment, from the scorning. As, as Paul wrote here, verse 36, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. The suffering that we go through, as long as we are following Christ, we have a stamp of approval on that. We can have relief knowing that we are doing what is right. So Christ brings that desire for relief to know that we are doing what is right. He also brings us desire, or the, us relief from bondage. Romans 7, just back one chapter. Now I am not referencing the, the bondage um, concern, that we are freed from concerning salvation. When we are saved, we are freed from the, the penalty of sin. This is a different type of bondage. Romans 7, um, I wonder to start reading verse 18, but for time's sake, <clears throat> we'll just start reading in verse 23. No, 22, excuse me. But I delight, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Paul here speaking to the struggle of the Christian life. How you want to serve God, you want to please God, but you have that flesh that wants to sin. And sometimes you'll serve God, sometimes you'll serve yourself, you'll serve sin. And it's a struggle, it's a battle. And sin is seeking to keep you in bondage to it, to sin. To keep your flesh in bondage to sin. And Christ gives us the victory over that. As Paul gets in there, the last two verses, he's like, oh, wretched man that I am. What, what a horrible state to be in. Wanting to do good, but doing evil instead. He says, who can help me out with this? Who can deliver me from this? Who can provide relief from this? And it's Jesus Christ. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I set myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And then he'll go dive into chapter 8 and give more helps with that. But what I want to point out here is that the struggle here that we all deal with is actually a good thing. Those who have no relief from this struggle or they have no relief from the bondage of sin, excuse me, they do not have a struggle. They do not have a battle. Those who have never been saved, they wake up, they don't have to struggle with it. They don't have an inner turmoil saying, I want to serve God, but I also want to serve myself. There is no struggle. There is no battle for them. What a horrible place to be. They wake up and they have no choice. They're going to serve the inner man, the old man. They are utterly subservient to sin. There is no law of God in place in their life. And again, we often have the wrong view of this. We dread the struggle. We grow weary of fighting. What we should do is fall on our knees and thank God that there is a battle, that we do have the opportunity to do good. That we have a chance, unlike those who are outside of Christ, we have a chance to live for God. We have this great opportunity before us. And yes, it's hard. I'm not downplaying that at all. But we have that opportunity and we can overcome because we have Jesus Christ. Because the desire of all nations has come to us. So he gives us relief from the bondage of sin, from having to serve sin, from having no choice but to serve sin. God, Jesus Christ, gives relief from that. Many different things we could bring up and point out how Christ is the desire of all nations, how he fills the longing of each soul. But we'll go ahead and, and stop right here. We'll come to a close. The desire of all nations has already come. And then, of course, he left. He's back in heaven. The desire of our souls, Jesus Christ, 
He will meet your soul's longings. He will meet your soul's desire if you will only come to him and put your faith and trust in his work on the cross. I'm going to finish with one of the most famous verses in the Bible. Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David had God as his shepherd. He filled the desire of his soul. And he says, I don't want, I, I, I have no need for anything else. God has filled the desire of my soul. I don't need anything else. The psalmist's desires were fulfilled in the Lord and are yours this evening. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes.